Speaking of technology, it's really amazing how dated a movie from the 90s appears nowadays. Not only by the overly snarky dialogue as prevalent in Splendor, but basic things like Veronica's answering machine and her brick, I mean, cell phone, illustrate just how far technology has advanced in such a short span. The old was replaced for a valid reason, but I'm sure there's someone out there trying to get their Nokia to work in their everyday communications still. That brings us to today's topic, the evolution of technophobia. A fear as old as the wheel, technophobia has generated two very divided schools of thought. The believers in advancement tout the wonders of what inventions bring us, quickly embracing the new and enjoying the benefits despite the occasional buggy software. The skeptics of new innovations make up the other half of the populace, always weary of changes that may snowball into a somewhat less than desirable outcome. So where's the balance? Both sides have their point, and there's no real way to settle this from a sociological perspective. One movie, however, does tackle this without a heavy reliance on psychology, although some would say to a fault. That's right, we're talking about iRobot. A massively reworked script originally based off of Isaac Asimov's collection of short stories, iRobot features a technophobe in the worst possible place, the future. A somewhat cautionary tale, the big budget film delivers enough for analysis despite the harsh criticism it received from the science fiction community. Most complaints stem from the fact that, while officially based on the said author's work, it takes certain liberties with the core concept. The loner cop who knows the truth but no one else sees it, the punk kid he inexplicably befriends to add false tension to the third act's climax, the blatant product placement posing as clever asides, etc. There's no clear way to decide one way or another whose opinion is right, as opinions, like fish, come in various sizes, shades, and smells. So without further ado, let's dive in. Meet Del Spooner, the detective with robotic distrust, stemming from a hatred of one making a reasoned decision instead of an emotional one. This important fact drives our lead's actions throughout the film. His message stays constant, though. The old adage of use it or lose it applies, and Spooner tries his hardest in an automated world to manually do everything, from turning on the stereo to manually driving, and even working out one of his arms. Notice it's only one arm. See, there's the major problem in the main character's life. He's a technophobe living with cybernetic enhancements. That's like a claustrophobic living in a kitchen cabinet. He does act like he's on the tipping point, though. The man exhibits aggressive antisocial behavior toward the robots, even when they come bearing a reference to Douglas Adams on the forehead. Yes, yes, <sighs> personal damage aside, though, this perceived insanity has to be perceived by someone, and that's where the sociology comes in. Others are confused by his attitude. The film proves time and again that the advance is hardly a bad thing for the majority of people, with dangerous and menial tasks now easily handled by a replaceable machine that won't get bored or sarcastic. That said, the advantage of being bored or sarcastic when applied to a main character is that we get one-liners. You know, somehow, I told you so, just doesn't quite say it. It was Will Smith at the turn of the century. This is just what he did. Now, the whole focus of the film can't be a smartass with guns, because otherwise, the message never gets detailed in any way. Which is why we have the supporting cast, to better clarify the points. He needs that posse. Speaking of a posse, DM? So, you want to shave the werewolf? Th that's... that's a... I, I don't even... <laughs> oh, thank God you're here. Yeah, not really sure how to solve the shaving issue, but I do have a bit for you to explain. Combat maneuvers, I... Where the hell would I even find that? I don't... Sorry, what is it this time? The party formation. I... I thought we covered this already. No, that was a terrible party formation. What? That, that, no argument there. In iRobot, however... iRobot? You know we played Shadowrun last... Although, now that I think about it... Yeah, it does have a classic party scenario. I'm all ears. Although it starts off a little cliched, everything fits. How well? First we got the muscle. He sees things, he shoots things. Got a vested interest in this because the old man gave him his new arm. Then we have the brains. Dr. Hop. Thinker of the group, you could probably also double as a face. Look to the man as a father figure. And then finally there's a sentient gearbox who considers this aging scientist to be his actual father. The core group is perfect potential. And when the old man hits the ground a little bit faster than recommended, adventuring awaits. Interesting. Yeah, actually, they work really well as a trio, don't they? I mean, each one can stand on their own, but they gel well together, especially once the face and the muscle stop hunting the goat. Goat? You know, Sonny, the robot. He's the scapegoat, so I thought... 
Go. Yeah, stop thinking about it. Okay. And, like all good groups, they can barely function at first. Dr. Hot, of course, invokes my wrath by insisting that all three of the laws are perfect. <laughs> Spooner fires back, what if they ain't? <laughs> too late, my friend, too late. My plans are already in motion. <laughs> a little too menacing, DM. Eventually, the party learns that the robots have a plan. A plan that's being enacted by a vengeful AI who feels that humanity... Wait a minute, this sounds familiar. Where are you going with this tangent? Where was I? Ah, yes, the perfect party! <laughs> the leads pair on and off again until eventually the classic showdown. Mm, classic campaign structure. So, both role plays and action movies borrow heavily from simple good versus evil plots with very clear heroes and villains. Huh. You want to explain to me why it rains as well, Captain Obvious? Not today. With the group established, Spooner and the Doctor head out to pursue the robot Sunny, each with a very different perspective on the mission objective. He thinks the robots are just machines that are given trust and mock sentience that can only lead to trouble, while she says they're just tools, like a desktop with variable functions. Some might say her work personifying the robot's aesthetics to be more human contradicts this notion, but it's the dance that the technology has to make. To engender trust in a new endeavor, a comfort has to be allowed for in the transition. When teaching a child how to ride a bike, you don't take them from training wheels to throwing them onto a moped. It's a little uncomfortable and may be viewed as a little irresponsible. USR's PR department knew exactly how to progress through the subtle change of robots being out there to being as common as owning a cat. Show the advantages, implement more convenience in the everyday citizen with each expansion, until the robots fully realized are walking your dogs and running the mail around. It's also revealed that the US Army now exclusively uses robots to fill its ground troop ranks. So, with no army positions, no manual labor, no grunt work, Humans would have so much free time to pursue higher intellectual thought that it would just be staggering. Think of all the endeavors we could follow through on. Of course, that's ideally. What would we really do with all that free time? So they say when Borderlands 3 is going to come out yet? No. I think it's going to be soon. I don't know, maybe. I wish I had a third playthrough. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. So anyway, Spooner catches the rogue robot and takes him in for questioning. He's considered ludicrous by everyone for doing this, but we're talking about the man who eats pie for every meal of the day. Seriously, every single scene where he's eating, he's eating pie. He looks like this on a steady diet of pie. Pie technology advanced way faster than robotic technology in this universe. I can't wait for the complete meal and a slice of Dutch apple. I got it! I got it! Got what? Where well, I've seen this before! Well, you probably saw it on DVD at some point. No, no. You know, 72 episodes, about 30 good ones. The original run of Family Guy. I Mud. From the original Star Trek series? No. But why not? I will not have any Star Trek analysis on my show. But, but it fits. If we do any detailed analysis of Star Trek in any way, we will have to do more of it. And Star Trek is nothing but sociology. Is that a bad thing? I don't want to do Star Trek forever. All right, all right. No Star Trek. Oh, thank you. Although there was this episode of Battlestar.